Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Deepan Shah with Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. And I'm pleased today to have two of our advanced CV imaging fellows here with us. And they'll be presenting interesting multimodality cases. Uh, to begin with, just a couple of housekeeping uh, points. Um, we, we would like this to be an uh, interactive uh, format. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, go to poll ev.com and enter the keyword debakey and you can enter your question or by cell phone you can text to 37607 and text the word debakey and you can enter your question there um, so we'll, we'll give the uh, each of our speakers an opportunity to present their interesting case and then we'll have some time for a q a afterward uh, also for the folks here at houston methodist that are connected via zoom uh, if you type in the chat box that you have a question or you raise your hand on zoom we'll give you an opportunity to ask a question live uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, let me get started. Our first uh, speaker is Dr. Amr Telmasani, and Amr is one of our uh, advanced uh, multimodality imaging fellows here doing uh, multimodality imaging training in uh, cardiac MRI, cardiac CT, as well as echocardiography. Amr came to us from Canada where he did his internal medicine residency and his cardiology fellowship training at McGill University and uh, is with us now for two years. So Amr, I'm gonna turn the floor to you. Uh, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Perfect, thank you so much, Dr. Shah. Okay, hi everyone. So um, I'll present an interesting case uh, which has a multimodality approach. So let's get started. So uh, this is a regular day in the echo lab here. So we have a 71 year old gentleman <clears throat> who was referred to the echo lab for uh, atrial fibrillation. So this is a parasternal long axis view. Um, we could see that the LV systolic function seems to be probably mildly depressed. The RV function, uh, I'll show it to you. So the RV function here probably like normal to mildly depressed mitral and aortic valve. There is nothing uh, impressive uh, on them. So moving to the short axis, so here we do have some image like difficulty. We do have, we have shadowing here, but this is short axis. This is the LV, the RV, and this is the cut at the base where we see the mitral valve. Again, uh, it, it's difficult to, to judge on the systolic function here. Same thing on the apical fork chamber. So the LV, RV, and LARA. So tough, tough to say because of the shadowing. Same thing here, this is the two chamber view. And also same thing here for the three chamber view. And um, as a standard of practice uh, here at Methodist in the lab, whenever we have uh, suboptimal image quality, uh, we always give LV opacification agent. So that's what has been given. So this is a four chamber view. We see it better, not the best, but better. Um, this is the four chamber and this is the two chamber and this is the three chamber so like overall probably the lv function in the 30s around let's say 35 and for the septum it's unclear if there is a septal bounce or not uh, it's not that clear so then um, moving uh, to the doppler inflow so the e waves are not uh, high and we don't see the a waves which is expected uh, due to the atrial fibrillation. For the tissue dopplers, the E prime, lateral E prime, we have it borderline low. And for the medial E prime, we see it like it does very well uh, past the 10. So, and that was an innocent bystander, which, which is a, a PFO. This is a subcostal view. So, Overall, it's like a difficult image quality. The EF was coded 30 to 35 percent. So in this situation where the, um, the images are not the greatest and also the EF was low, uh, when in doubt, we need to call for the superhero. And the superhero here, I mean the magnet. So this gentleman uh, underwent uh, cardiac MRI, which showed uh, the following. So I'll guide you through this. 
So this is a short axis view. This is the LV and this is the RV. This is the anterior wall. This is the anterior lateral, inferior lateral, inferior, and this is the septum. And this is the pericardial fat. And also we notice uh, like a, a uh, unusual structure adjacent to the RV. To judge more into that, we need to have uh, more slices. So moving onward, so this is again short axis view, but this time at the mid cavity where we see the papillary muscles. And we do see this structure here, which could be either like intrapericardial, or it could be extrapericardial. So let's move on with more pictures. So this is mid to apical view, again, short axis. And at this time, we need to think if it's inside or outside the pericardium, that depends on our understanding of the uh, pericardial fat. So how many layers of the fat and where does the pericardium uh, uh, lies? So for that, uh, this is a, a nice article where they show the types of the fat uh, in the heart. So we can appreciate two types of the heart. One is uh, adjacent to the uh, myocardium, which is called the epicardial fat. And here where the uh, coronaries sit. And then there is one outside the pericardium, which is called the paracardial fat. And the surgeon is fl what's, what's flipping here, like the white color, this is the uh, pericardium. So going back to the same cut, and, and this, is, uh, the, the, this picture is from the same uh, reference, sorry. Sorry, so we see the uh, blue colored the tagged fat, which is the one adjacent to the heart, that is the epicardium. And the outer one, which, it ta which is tagged with red, which is here, this is the outer one. And sandwiched between them is the pericardium, which we see it here. So if we do follow the line, so we go here, here, so it separates to the one on top and the one on bottom, and we can see it here. So this is the a visceral pericardium, and this is the parietal pericardium, so this is an intrapericardial uh, structure, and it's most like an, an, a localized pericardial effusion. And um, also, like to confirm that, the concept is the pericardium usually is squished or sandwiched between uh, both layers of fat, so this is the paracardial fat, and this is the epicardial fat, so that's another confirmation that this is an intra uh, pericardial structure. So another feature to note about this, so it's localized against the RV and also the, the, the density, it does have like higher dark signal uh, which could suggest proteinaceous or uh, bloody uh, pericardial effusion. So moving on, this is the epical views. Again, we, it's, it's a localized against the RV. This is the LV apex and this is the RV. So this is equivalent to the uh, uh, three chamber on the echo. So this is the LV, this is the LV, LA, mitral valve, aorta, and th this is the RV, nothing much here. And this is the four chamber. This is the LV, this is the RV. So again, we see the same structure and it's, uh, it could maybe mild restriction of the RV relaxation slash it could be RV uh, dysfunction here. Um, and also I would like to point out that the uh, innocent bystander, the PFO, we do see it here. We do see like small flow going from the left side uh, to the right side. And the LV function seems to be like on the, uh, on the lower side, but probably not in the 30s. Uh, it's around um, 45, 50 even. So this is a two-chamber view. This is the anterior wall. This is the inferior wall, left atrium. And this structure here is the left atrial appendage. So uh, uh, an interesting thing is uh, after we see the fat, because as we said, the pericardium is sandwiched between the epicardium and the uh, paracardial fat, the pericardium here looks thickened and even has a much darker signal compared to what we see usually. So this should raise a suspicion of possible uh, calcification. 
So again, so this is uh, an RV inflow and outflow. So this is the right atrium, tricuspid valve, RV, and this is the pulmonic valve. And to localize the effusion, now we see it more here on the uh, inferior side. So it's anterior and inferior to the RV. So I won't cause you headache with like mentioning all the sequences names, but we use this one to measure the thickness of the pericardium and the pericardium measured uh, like uh, borderline uh, increase around three uh, millimeter. And in this sequence, we check if there is acute inflammation of the pericardium. In that case, the pericardium will be filled with fluid. And if it was filled with fluid, it should look bright as we see the pleural effusion down here. So here we don't see it, so it's, it's more of a specific sign. If we see it, it's there. If not, then we have to look into uh, to, uh, the more robust uh, methods, which will come to it shortly. So we don't see uh, inflammation here. So then, again, when in doubt, we go to the money shot. We use the late gadolinium enhancement. So how the late gadolinium enhancement work is uh, when we infuse the gadolinium and it goes into normal cells, it goes into uh, extracellular matrix, the cells are intact, so it will be washed out immediately. However, when there is any destruction of the cells, inflammation or scar, this gadolinium seeps into the cells and will not be washed out until later. So that's why it's called late gadolinium enhancement, because we do re-image the patient uh, after seven to 10 minutes after injecting the gadolinium. So this is a 3D LGE and we see nicely brightness here. So like bright means uh, presence of gadolinium. So, uh, uh, and it does overlie the area of the uh, localized pericardial effusion. So that's int uh, interesting. So there is some sort of acute pericarditis here, but the interesting finding is the other side of the heart here, we don't see inflammation, which is unusual. Uh, most of the time when there is inflammation in the pericardium, like the whole pericardium is inflamed. So um, that was somewhat interesting. Uh, uh, sorry, probably the image is a little bit blurry, but this is from the 3D LGE. This is short axis, this is the LV, this is uh, the RV. And this is the localized diffusion. Again, we could appreciate the LGE here in the localized diffusion, but it, it is absent on the lateral wall. So the good thing that the patient uh, needed to uh, undergo cardiac CT uh, to assist for coronary uh, blockages. And when we opened it up, we were surprised by seeing this finding. So. Uh, bright on CT means calcium. So we appreciate thick calcium here and even more on the lateral side with very, uh, very minimal overlying the effusion. And looking at the uh, lateral wall, also same thing. So we could see a calcification on the lateral wall and minimal calcification uh, in the uh, localized pericardial effusion. So just to compare the CT with the MRI, the area of calcification has no LGE, and the area with the minimal calcification does have the LGE. So this could suggest this localized area does have some sort of acute uh, inflammatory process. So this is a 3D reconstruction, and just to orient you about it, sorry. So here, so this is the sternum, and this is the vertebral column posteriorly. The red object is the heart, and the yellow shell, this is the calcified pericardium. So if you looked at it, we do see multiple areas where the pericardium is not calcified. So this is a, a partial calcification of the uh, pericardium, and Okay, so here, okay, sorry. Okay, so 
What, uh, what's behind the sternum is the RV, where we saw the localized pericardial effusion, and we could appreciate there is no uh, calcified pericardium behind the sternum, which correlates again with the CT, with the MRI uh, images as well. So then maybe let's have a second look at the echocardiogram. Um, this, could this be the calcification? Maybe yes and maybe no. Could this one be also like at the, at the bottom of it? S sometime we do see this, these higher signals, but I mean, this might be correlating with what we saw. And here on the, uh, at the epical segment, same thing at the epical segment here and here. And then what about this uh, medial uh, E prime, the septal E prime? So we do see it's exaggerated, and at one point it could be reaching even 14 centimeter per second. Could this suggest some sort of constriction? It's unclear. We didn't have a longer uh, clip with the respiratory variation, and that was mainly because of the indication. So the indication was for atrial fibrillation and not for constriction. And that's very important. That was indication matters. But then, one could say, how could anyone know about this uh, pericardial calcification before having the CT uh, or the cardiac MR? And I would answer by this. So this chest X-ray tells the story. So we do see a shell uh, of the calcium around the pericardium all around. So this could suggest calcification. So we could have added uh, pericardial calcification to rule out constriction. So I'll give you a little bit of background on the patient. So this is a 71-year-old uh, gentleman uh, who came with a chief complaint of uh, shortness of breath on exertion with lower limb edema for two weeks. He did have a prior history of COVID-19. Uh, he did have peripheral artery disease. He did have psoriatic arthritis, uh, smoking. Uh, and also excessive alcohol use. Um, to think about what could, might cause this calcification, the patient did not have uh, prior history of radiation, did not have previous history of TB, or even previous history of uh, viral pericarditis. He came here, he was found to have atrial fibrillation, and that was, the echo was done. Um, and he's hemodynamically stable, so that also goes against having significant constriction um, as the patient is maintaining uh, the blood pressure and uh, improving with, uh, with diuresis. Um, so since I, I, was, uh, I was looking for the uh, ventricular interdependence, unfortunately we didn't have that on the, uh, on the MR again because the indication was not for constriction. But I couldn't help not to find one of, our, uh, one of our patients who did have this localized diffusion just to show you how the MRI could show a neat uh, ventricular interdependence with the respiratory variation. So um, yeah, so next time if you are thinking of constriction, MRI will be like a good modality to do that. So when you see this calcification on the chest X-ray, and also you maybe see this on the echo, and for sure you see this uh, in the MRI, and definitely you see this on the CT. Uh, this will definitely be a pericardial calcification in an eggshell. Thank you. Great, very nice, uh, nice case, Amr, uh, and I think really highlights multimodality imaging. Um, again, if you know, we have a couple minutes, we can take some questions from the audience. Uh, if you go to pollev.com, enter DeBakey, or text DeBakey to 37607. Also, if we have any folks uh, from within uh, Houston Methodist on Zoom that want to ask any questions, please uh, raise your hand or, or type uh, in the chat box that you have a question. Uh, while we're waiting for that, Amr, let me... Uh, ask you to start off with, mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess the, the big question I think is going to be from a patient management standpoint. Right. Um, how would you manage this patient? It's true. So it's a, uh, it's a tough decision and it should be multidisciplinary discussion. Um, 
looking at the patient labs, actually, the patient CRP was almost normal, minimally elevated. So I'm not sure if there is um, a pure acute pericarditis uh, going on. Um, then I would probably go with the hemodynamics of the patient. If the patient is showing signs of constriction, then we need to put that into context. If not, then probably the patient, uh, because I, with, through the history, it does have more than uh, one issue to deal with. So uh, if the patient was hemodynamically stable, no significant constriction, probably this will be uh, dealt with later on. Um, and I think multidisciplinary approach uh, is a go, definitely. Okay. Yeah, and the reason I ask actually is interesting. I'm around, I'm, I'm on the hospital service this week, and he's a patient I just picked up yesterday. So uh, this is kind of a case in real time, and right. we're still trying to uh, unfold his, his management. And, and I think, you know, one of the points you, you raise is obviously he's got a, a variety of other issues as well. There's right. some GI bleeding issues and other things. So, you know, this, this adds an additional layer of complexity to it. Now, let me ask you, um, you know, aside from this particular case, um, you know, if you're dealing with pericardial diseases, mm. um, you know, I think you nicely showed echo, you nicely showed CMR, you nicely showed a, a CT case. Maybe if you could talk to us a little bit about what you think the strengths and weaknesses of each of the modalities are when it comes to pericardial disease to kind of help people put into context when would you get one test versus the other? Perfect. Uh, very nice question, Dr. Shah. So uh, if we start off with the, with the echo, uh, for the echo, um, it will be difficult to show the calcification. But the echo is really good in terms of showing the uh, ventricular interdependence. That's one. Second, there are uh, more than a um, uh, few signs, actually, to suggest constriction. For example, you have the medial E prime uh, exaggerated more than the lateral. Uh, you could have a restrictive uh, E wave uh, velocity, uh, and also for the uh, diastolic reversal in the hepatic veins. So, from that perspective, we could suspect a constriction uh, based on the echo. But then, uh, the question is: Is there acute inflammation or not? And uh, the echo cannot solve this question. For that reason, uh, the next modality will be the MRI. And as we showed nicely here, uh, having the late gadolinium enhancement uh, would give us this important information that uh, there is inflammation in the pericardium or not. And while having that, that would aid the, um, uh, the treating physician in giving uh, non-steroidal uh, medication uh, for the treatment. And lastly, for the CT, as we showed, so MRI is good for the inflammation, uh, and it could show the interdependence. But uh, the weakness is in terms of the calcification, as we saw here. Uh, we, di we, did we didn't pick it up very easily, but with the CT, it was like uh, immediately with the, with the first shot. So to assess pericardial calcification itself, I think the CT stands out uh, in terms of that. Okay. So I think, yes, I mean, I think it really seems like echo is great for the physiology. Right. MRI is good for looking at uh, the inflammation of the pericardium, and CT, I think, is ideal for calcification right. of the pericardium. We've got one question here. Uh, somebody texted in. It says, why do you think the patient uh, did not have constrictive physiology? Mm. Uh, it's a good question. So I'm not sure if... If that's because uh, when we looked at the CT, maybe with the with the three D construction, uh, construction, multiple areas of the heart were not calcified, so maybe that was compensating for it. Probably, if I would like um, give it uh, give it a thought, that that will be my thought. Yeah. And I think, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, to, to address that question, probably a good right heart cath might be useful in this patient as well right. to really look for. Uh, you know, evidence of, of constrictive physiology. Was there a question also from Zoom? No. no. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So I, I think you know. I mean, I think you, you you highlighted very nicely how different imaging modalities can come together. And I think really, you know, pericardial disease. I think is is uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an area that I think we're still learning more and more. Right. And I think it's a complicated disease process. And I think this is a case. You know, this highlights very nicely the advantage of using multimodality imaging 
to try to solve uh, uh, patient management questions. For sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, all right, so why yeah, don't we... Deepen, may I yes. make a comment? Zoom in, yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the calcification in pericardium is seen in the CT is very sensitive, but it's not very specific. Okay, so you can see a lot of calcification, but not doesn't mean automatically the patient going to have constriction. As a matter of fact, most of the patients do not have constrictive physiology, mm -hmm. even with a lot of calcification in the pericardium. So it's important to know that. Yeah, so I think you're absolutely right. I think that you know it gives you an anatomic assessment. Um, but again, ultimately, I think for the physiology, you need to, to look at tests that are going to give you the physiology. Okay, so what, why don't we go ahead, I'm going to move on to the, to the next presentation today uh, from Dr. Roa Attar. And uh, Roa also came to us from Canada. Uh, she did her internal medicine training at the University of Toronto and then did her uh, cardiology fellowship training at the University of uh, British Columbia. And Ro was here uh, for a year doing uh, advanced echocardiography training. And I think she's going to present to us uh, a case, I presume, that certainly involves echo and maybe some other modalities as well. Roa, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, so the patient I'll be presenting today is uh, an interesting uh, patient. Um, she's basically a 33-year-old uh, patient that uh, we had seen initially um, during her 24th week of pregnancy. So she's uh, Gravida 3, Para 2, uh, at 24 weeks gestation. Um, her cardiac history um, entails a diagnosis of a restrictive VSD. This was diagnosed at birth, and um, she has not had uh, any previous indications for closure. Her previous echocardiograms uh, had all uh, showed normal biventricular function. Her right-sided chambers were normal in size, and she had mainly left to right shunt. Um, she was asymptomatic and was functionally very active, um, so she had just been uh, managed conservatively. Um, in terms of her obstetric history, um, she again had two previous uncomplicated pregnancies um, uh, despite her cardiac diagnoses. So during this pregnancy, uh, she presented to an outside hospital with uh, a six-week history of fever and dry cough. Uh, her family members had similar symptoms and she was initially treated with a course of amoxicillin. This was followed by another subsequent course of clarithromycin because her symptoms were not improving. She started to develop lower limb edema and worsening shortness of breath, and that prompted a visit to the emergency department. At presentation, um, her vital signs uh, showed a uh, temperature of 38.8, uh, so she was febrile. Her blood pressure was 117 over 57, and her heart rate was 125 beats per minute. She was uh, saturating 100% on room air. Her JVP was elevated, and uh, her cardiovascular exam was revealing for a normal S1, normal S2, but uh, she did have a pretty loud uh, three out of six systolic murmur that was best heard at the left sternal border. Uh, she had decreased breath sounds um, at the left lung base, and she had plus one bilateral lower limb edema. Her ECG was really non-contributory to her presentation. Um, she was uh, in sinus rhythm, sinus tachycardia, um, and um, she had poor R-wave progression. Her initial laboratory investigations uh, had shown a white blood cell count of 9.2. Uh, she was anemic with a hemoglobin of 7.8, and this is certainly below what you'd expect in pregnancy and um, her uh, ESR was elevated at 35. Uh, her NT pro BMP was also elevated at 522 and initial blood cultures uh, had grown streptococcus viridians and those were from the hospital she was transferred out from. Um, they, just given uh, the context of uh, her symptoms, she was also swapped for COVID-19 influenza uh, and both were negative. So this was her initial echocardiogram. So um, we're going to start off with uh, the parasternal long axis. And uh, what you can see here is um, so her RV sized appear like it was slightly dilated. 
Uh, we can see um, a mass that is attached to the right side of the ventricular septum and um, I can perhaps convince you that there is um, a disconnection here which is her VSD. Um, her LV function uh, was hyperdynamic um, and so the second set of images um, so this is a zoomed in view of her again um, this is parasternal long and you can see uh, what appears to be a vegetation that was attached to the uh, ventricular side uh, of her septum and we can see flow across uh, that is left to right um, and this is basically her VSD. The other thing I'd like to point out is um, there's potentially some aortic regurgitation, but just given the eccentricity of it, it was very difficult to see on uh, these initial uh, transthoracic images. So this is um, uh, the view of the pulmonic valve and uh, again here even on the pulmonic valve we're seeing what appears to be um, another uh, vegetation or a potential vegetation. And um, this is our parasternal short axis view and on the parasternal short axis view, um, again, what we're seeing is um, what looks like um, a subaortic VSD, and we can see flow across um, This is just another color compare image of the um, pulmonic valve, and we're again seeing that this patient has potentially mild pulmonary regurgitation with what looks like, again, another vegetation. So to give everyone a sense of her LV function and chamber size, um, both chambers appeared dilated, uh, both LV and RV. Um, the left ventricular function was preserved, um, so was her RV function. What was interesting was on um, Dopplers of her uh, aortic arch, uh, we were able to see holodiastolic flow reversal, which prompted us to think that she probably had uh, more than severe aortic regurgitation, and um, this needed to be investigated further given her subaortic um, VSD. So. This is a four-chamber view of her cardiac MRI. Um, so what we can appreciate here, so we can see that she has a pericardial effusion. Um, her, both chambers are dilated and um, her LV function uh, appeared preserved. So this is a three-chamber view or um, a long-axis view of um, of, uh, of <laughs> and basically what we're seeing is um, significant aortic regurgitation. Um, and I think we can all appreciate that here. Um, but what we can also see is we can see a prolapsing segment um, of whether this is one of the coronary cusps or if this is um, an aneurysm, it's a little unclear on this um, uh, MRI, but we can definitely see left to right flow uh, or shunting across her VSD as well. Um, and then, so to quantify her aortic regurgitation better, um, so flow flow mapping was done and. Uh, we were able to obtain a regurgitant volume of 68. Her regurgitant fraction was 48%, um, all which were consistent with severe aortic regurgitation. 
So just given the complexity of um, her situation, um, so she was basically 34 weeks pregnant. And um, in patients that are pregnant, um, the indications for surgery are a little uh, more challenging uh, given the context. Um, so if she wasn't pregnant, she would be somebody that probably would be um, somebody that would really have a good indication for surgery uh, given the degree of um, aortic regurgitation and the prolapse that she had. But um, uh, after an extensive discussion with the patient, um, she was not um, in favor of going on with surgery that may have potential risk to losing her um, her fetus. Uh, so the decision was made to treat her medically um, and in hospital until she would be able to deliver a viable baby. So um, she was basically admitted um, in hospital and uh, spent um, close to two months in hospital uh, with very careful medical management um, and um, just close follow-up with serial transthoracic echocardiograms. So this was her uh, repeat transthoracic echocardiogram. And here I think we can all appreciate. So the AR is very eccentric. It's posteriorly directed. And um, we can see this prolapsing. We can't actually see the right cusp there. Um, and we can see the vegetation is still there. Um, and this was despite her being uh, treated um, with appropriate antimicrobial therapy for her uh, infective endocarditis. Um, this is just, um, again, showing uh, the extent of her AI. We can see fluttering, diastolic fluttering on her echo images. Um, and you can see early closure of her mitral valve from the extensive aortic regurgitation. So she had this very prolonged hospitalization um, where mainly it was management of heart failure. She also unfortunately developed um, renal dysfunction that was presumed to be secondary to both uh, decompensated heart failure as well as um, antimicrobial induced. Uh, she completed a four-week course of vancomycin and daptomycin and um, uh, then underwent uh, a C-section at 33 weeks um, for fetal deceleration. Um, she was discharged home um, in a pretty good condition and she returned five weeks later um, after elective, uh, for elective cardiac surgery. So these are images of her intraoperative TE. Just given, again, her clinical context and pregnancy, we didn't um, see a need to do further um, echocardiographic imaging with the MRI that we had, as well as um, the echo images that were um, quite helpful in diagnostic. So here you can see that the right cusp, you can barely see it, it's prolapsing. Um, and to show you the, the color images, so we can see what looks like um, a ruptured um, sinus of Valsalva here. And this wasn't as obvious to us on the transthoracic echocardiogram and was not really that obvious on the MRI either. So this again, I think, highlights the importance of um, multimodality imaging where every one of our imaging modalities is likely to provide a useful piece of information in terms of mechanism and etiology of this um, And so, um, so what happened was, um, so these findings were noted um, intraoperatively as well. The uh, membranous septum was intact. It was confirmed as being a conal VSD, and um, a patch repair to the VSD was completed, um, as well as um, resection of the uh, sinus of Valsalva fistula. Um, and what happened was uh, the surgeon did a very excellent job um, by uh, reconstructing um, the 
uh, aortic root and um, uh, Basically, there was a sinus of Valsalva patch that was sewn in. Um, so, in terms of post-operative course, uh, the patient um, did well post-operatively. Um, she had um, an ejection fraction uh, post-operatively that was 26%. Um, her uh, repair results were very uh, well, and her sh her, uh, her imaging findings showed mild aortic regurgitation. She was discharged home on both just an alpril and torosamide. So this is her MRI, and um, her post-operative MRI shows um, some LV dysfunction with an ejection fraction in the 30s. Um, and here we see mild aortic regurgitation. Or and the pulmonic valve, interestingly, didn't really show any vegetations. Um, so what we were seeing on the echocardiogram was probably um, just a cut of the original vegetation uh, that was seen on the ventricular side of the septum. So um, she right now is nine months postpartum. She became pregnant again with her fourth child after her surgery. Um, so she was followed up very closely given her high-risk pregnancy and um, she had a very uncomplicated clinical course, tolerated her fourth pregnancy very well. Her most recent echocardiogram shows a normal EF that's hyperdynamic and mild AR and she's done very well. Um, so I just have a few slides. Um, so um, sinus of Valsalva aneurysms are very rare. Um, the true prevalence of sinus of Valsalva aneurysm is really unknown. Uh, the estimated rate is approximately 0.1% or less in the general population. And of congenital defects, they comprise about 0.1 to 3.5%. Um, untreated sinus of Valsalva aneurysms pretend a really poor prognosis. And uh, in one report, um, this was uh, a life expectancy of less than one year. Um, so right and non-coronary sinus, uh, sinuses are embry embryologically derived from the distal bulbar septum. And that basically may be why they're associated with VSDs, and VSDs are the most common associated um, uh, anomaly that we typically see with them. But they're also associated with other um, congenital conditions, uh, such as um, aortopathies, um, as well as um, um, connective tissue disorders, and also um, they're associated uh, with bicuspid aortic valves as well. Um, so the left sinus is less frequently affected by congenital lesions because it doesn't arise from the bulbar septum and it's it usually has a more benign course uh, clinically than the rest. Um, so uh, the role of transthoracic echo, um, so echo is helpful in identifying um, which um, cusp uh, the aneurysm may be located at and um, it may help us identify, you know, where it's likely to rupture, but other imaging modalities are also just as useful. So what our patient had was um, this right, uh, she had a aneurysm of her right uh, sinus of Valsalva and we were seeing flow into the RVOT. Um, so this is a, um, a statement paper that was put out by the, um, by, um, by a, not ASC, it was a statement paper that was put out by uh, a group of multimodality imagers. And um, what they had recommended was um, a transthoracic echocardio, uh, echocardiography be first line in terms of imaging. Um, echo would be very helpful um, in identifying um, the type of um, 
aneurysm, and um, it would also be helpful um, in terms of identifying other associated congenital uh, anomalies that may be associated with the SVA. And um, it also would be helpful in identifying complications related to um, the SVA. Um, when transthoracic echocardiography doesn't give us uh, a clear-cut answer or we're likely to need uh, more uh, anatomical definition, then uh, transesophageal echocardiography may be helpful in, in helping um, identify again um, a more clear mechanism. Uh, we are able to get better resolution um, with TEE, uh, especially of um, the aortic valve on uh, on long axis at about 120 degrees or so. Um, and then if we're having uh, difficulty um, finding an appropriate answer uh, or if we need more help in terms of clinical management, then uh, both uh, uh, cardiac CT as well as cardiac MRI um, uh, would be helpful. So cardiac MRI, like in our patient, um, it was very helpful in quantitating um, the severity of aortic regurgitation. Um, the other caveat with our patient is she was pregnant, um, and pregnant, pa pregnant patients, um, obviously, we want to avoid radiation, but that's not to say that CT is prohibitive in uh, pregnant patients because it's still, we know, it's pretty safe. Um, but CMR would uh, provided the exact same answers we basically would have um, needed otherwise. And um, the, the beauty about uh, quantification and flows is that we actually don't need to give gadolinium, which is the thing that has really not been studied um, in pregnant patients. And we're really unsure of safety of um, contrast agents there. Um, and if we need to further characterize um, coronary anatomy along with um, aortic pathology. Um, so if we wanted to get um, aortic uh, diameters or if we needed to, um, again, um, uh, obtain uh, further um, anatomic assessment, then cardiac CT or cardiac MRI would both be useful in that regard. So by the same uh, authors, they put out um, Again, uh, a summary of essentials that um, that should be looked into when we're assessing uh, sinus of Valsalva aneurysms um, during follow-up and sur surveillance. Yeah. And um, it basically what they had recommended was that we should be obtaining aortic diameters, um, so uh, aortic annulus, um, sinus of Valsalva, ascending aorta, and I think most of us do this in our labs. Um, the other thing is um, uh, they recommend that we look for the origin of the SVA as well as the diameter of the SVA and the growth rate per year. Um, they also recommended um, looking at uh, adjacent chambers and structures um, to see any, if there's any evidence of compression. And um, again, if there's any evidence of rupture uh, like our patient here, then it would be helpful to look at that, and um, for intracardiac shunt quantification, although CMR would also be helpful there, and it's probably more accurate, um, and uh, to look at aortic valve morphology and cusp number. Um, and I'm just going to conclude with, um, so the biggest study that looked at um, these SVAs is really, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an experience of uh, a Chinese population. They had 212 patients, and that's probably the largest I've seen in a series of patients uh, that had SVAs, just given the rarity of this diagnosis. Um, and um, the sensitivity and specificity, as well as accuracy of transthoracic for diagnosing SVAs was 93%, 99, and 98, respectively. They had a high proportion of missed SVAs, um, and that was 77%, um, but those were mainly, um, they were um, SVAs that extended into the RV through a VSD. Um, so transthoracic echo um, uh, basically diagnosed all complications within their study. 
um, except for vegetations. Um, and the most common misdiagnosed associated lesion was the basically uh, RVOT um, and uh, stenosis or if patients had VSDs. And that's really all I have for you guys. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, that was a very nice case. That there's a lot to unpack in that yeah. case for sure. So maybe um, one, you know, first off, for folks that are tuning in, uh, again, if you have any questions, you can go to pollev.com, enter Debakey, or uh, via text, uh, go to three seven six zero seven, and text the word Debakey uh, and enter your question. Uh, if we have anybody on Zoom that has a question that wants to come. Uh, we're happy to take that at Valeria. If, if you're on the line, if you're listening, we'd love to get your input on this case as well. Um, I, you know, and I think this, this case highlights obviously the complexities, uh, one of the disease you're dealing with, and then to, to couple that, I think, with pregnancy as well. And I think that that really then, you know, potentially limits your options, both from a, a diagnostic standpoint, uh, as well as I think from a management standpoint. Um, one question I guess I have for you, this was actually this patient's third pregnancy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the first two pregnancies, she did perfectly fine? She did during perfectly those. fine. So why do you think it was that the first two, uh, she did very well, and then it, the third one is when she kind of ran into problems? Um, so I think in this patient, um, so I think it may have been the trigger here was infective endocarditis. So. So yes, SVAs are, I talked about congenital SVAs, but I just don't know if this was potentially um, a SVA that was caused by infection or if it was infection in, infectious in origin and that may have led to that prolapse. And with that prolapse, you know, she developed severe AI. And that, because her presentation was actually very acute. She did very well throughout the first 18 weeks of her pregnancy, so. Okay, um, and uh, again, any, if there's any questions uh, from anybody, uh, either on Zoom, feel free to uh, uh, unmute yourself. I think Valeria, I see her unmuting. Valeria? Yes, Dr. Yes. Shai, and thank you, Roa, for a wonderful presentation. Um, this was quite a challenge, challenging case to, to take care for, like Dr. Shah and Ro were mentioned, because of the complexities of pregnancy. I think um, this, uh, like Roa pointed out, probably endocarditis was the complicated factor here. She, she did not, we met her in the acute settings with endocarditis, pregnancy, and heart failure, renal failure. She was transferred to us from an outside facility. Um, but before that, we reviewed her records. She had been following with a cardiologist, and she did not have indications for intervention on her VSD. And uh, as you may know, patients uh, with a restricted VSD usually don't have indications unless there is aortic valve prolapse um, and causing AR and deterioration of the the aortic valve anatomy. I think in this case what happened is with the infection, the infection led to, um, to perforation of the right aortic cast and, and worsening of the prolapse of the aortic valve leading to a acute severe AR and that's what caused an increase in LVDP and in acute yeah, renal failure and, and so forth. But I, I think this highlights that during pregnancy, we we need to think, to think what are the uh, our tools to di accurately diagnose our, these patients and no, not shy away from studies like MRI when they're clinically indicated and can lead to um, a change in the, in, in, in the clinical um, in the clinical decision. Great. But wonderful presentation, Roa. Thank you for putting it together and sharing with everybody. All right, so I want to thank both uh, Roa and Amr, I think, for some very nice presentations today. And uh, we will uh, resume again next week. Uh, we'll have uh, a couple more interesting case presentations from our multimodality imaging fellows. So thank you all for tuning in today, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>